Um, while everyone's coming in, I'm going to introduce myself really quickly. I'm Abby Cornett, the, the patient advocate for IG Living Magazine. Uh, I don't have an address for you. Excuse me. I don't even know what that was. Um, I've been with IG Living for five years now. Uh, before that, I was the executive director of the Alliance for Biotherapeutics, which was a nonprofit that worked on access issues for patients with rare diseases. Um, we primarily dealt with insurance issues and uh, worked in Washington, D.C. And prior to that, I was a senator for eight years. Um, I got working with IG Living and into the rare disease community because I have a primary immune deficiency and started going back to Capitol Hill uh, with the IDF, which is the Immune Deficiency Foundation. Then I started working for IG Living Magazine and I worked with a whole uh, group of different disease states. The Myositis uh, Association asked me to give a presentation today on traveling with um, a physical impairment. Now, I've done articles on traveling and how to take your medica medications with you because a lot of people have to use intravenous medications or uh, subcutaneous medications. And traveling with those, um, there's always all types of concerns. So. They asked me to expand this out a little bit, and it was really an interesting topic. Um, and I had a, lot of, uh, had a lot of fun researching it. And while the title is Have Wheelchair Will Travel, it's a little bit broader than that. Uh, the first thing is don't let your disease stop you from living. That's the best thing I can tell you. Um, being a patient myself with something else, sometimes you want to like maybe not try or get outside your comfort zone. It's the best thing you can do, as long as you're healthy enough to do it. Brings us to your illness doesn't have to stop you. And what I researched is how to travel. And yesterday was a perfect example. It says, travel is stressful. Um, my company booked the wrong ticket for me. And they, and they went for a discount ticket. I, Got there, I had a big suitcase because I'm gone for 10 days. Knew that I had to check that bag, $25. They took my big bag, it went down the conveyor belt, went to get on the plane and they go, oh, your ticket doesn't allow you to have a carry-on. Okay, what does that mean? Because I have my computer and all the materials for the conference and my, my carry-on. I didn't get on the plane until they were closing the doors and I'd gotten there an hour and a half early. I was so stressed. Travel is stressful. It is unpredictable. And it's particularly unpredictable for a patient with a chronic illness or a disability. So the best thing you can do is plan ahead. Don't wait to the last minute on anything. And I'm going to give you some tips on how to make this successful. That is if I get the screen to switch here. And we are locked up. That is not cool. Presenting is stressful. There we go. Whoops, as we go back through a bunch of them. Okay. The first thing is because of so many accommodation laws requiring accommodation, it's getting easier to travel. And travel for people with disabilities is increasing. And one of the good things about that is the travel industry is recognizing that. And we'll cover it a little bit later, but a lot of travel agencies are actually specializing, having a little niche market in helping you plan travel, and they will take care of a lot of the, the details for you. But if you're doing it on your own, Planning to travel, we kind of covered that. The first thing is make yourself a pre-travel checklist. It's always a good idea to know exactly what you need ahead of time. So if you're talking about like a, a long vacation or a vacation overseas or where you're flying, make sure that you write down everything you need. Do you have all the uh, spare equipment you need for your mobility device? It was something I hadn't actually thought of, but mobility devices can break down. Do you have battery packs? 
What do you have in, in the way of medication? Do you need to order ahead of time? If you're going to be gone for an extended period of time and you utilize a specialty pharmacy, do you need to have a prescription in the state you're moving to? If you have to have an infusion, do you have a doctor set up in another state to do that or a facility or an infusion center? Oh my goodness, come on. One of the things that you need to do, and we'll try and get this unlocked here in a minute, is before you decide to go anywhere, particularly if you have a mobility device, you need to decide where you're going to go. You want to be able to have the same experiences as people that don't have a mobility device. So that, again, you need to check um, where you're going. And if you're looking at traveling overseas, you need to look at that country's laws in regards to accommodations. Um, that was one of the things that I was interested in when I uh, was looking at it. A lot of the air airlines, depending on where they're based out of, don't have the same requirements when traveling overseas. All right, this is, there we go. Another thing, when you're deciding to go, look at the weather. We, uh, I have a great slide if I could get it to work that, there we go. When you decide, I'm thinking about going, patients should consider your treatment and your options for treatment where you're planning on traveling. The infusion center, like I mentioned, make sure you have enough medication if you're going, and then consider the weather. This was not something I had thought of. Um, if you are in a wheelchair or have a scooter, you're not going to want to travel to Minnesota necessarily in the wintertime. Look at your destination. The other thing is a lot of diseases are exacerbated by extreme heat. Um, if heat bothers you, you need to take that into consideration also. You need to consider if it's hurricane season, can you get evacuated, um, and what your insurance is for that. It's warm in here. Yeah, I'm trying. This is not my computer. This is the hotel's computer. And it is annoying in the extreme. There we go. All right. Do you want me to open the doors? Do you think that would uh, cool it off in here? Yeah. All right. Huh? Could you see if we can turn that down a little bit and I'll open one of these doors up so we can get some air? I noticed in the morning session they had all the doors open. You're welcome to come in. Okay. Well, it's you guys' computer, so my computer's encrypted, so I can use it. Yes, they are. All right. Is that the slide you wanted to take a look at? Now, all the slides are on the website. They were uploaded. Then this is, we already looked at this one. Now, tips. If you're planning on traveling, always have an emergency contact um, locally in the area you're visiting. If you can, um, if you're traveling where there's family or friends or have uh, your doctor established or know where the medical centers are. Make sure the location of the closest hospital in case you have a medical emergency to the hotel that you're staying in. Have medical identification card, jewelry in case of emergency, or um, keep a flash drive with you that has your medical records on it and the medications you're on and your contact information and keep that on your person. Um, you can wear it on a little lanyard around your neck. Um, I have mine on a fly stripe that I keep in my purse. Always contact your specialty pharmacy when traveling and to keep them informed. 
they may, de may need to have additional orders from your physician, depending on the state or the location you're traveling to. So if you're going to be gone for an extended period of time or, and you know you're going to take your medications with you, before you go, there are some recommendations. Find out about your insurance policy. Particularly if you're traveling overseas, you need to make sure that if you get ill overseas that your insurance covers you. If not, there are supplemental policies you can buy for traveling. You also want to get travel insurance in case you get ill before you go so your vacation is secured or your money is secured. Check, with your va check on your vaccinations depending on the location you're going to. Um, a lot of people haven't real, don't really think about this, but if you already have an immune issue or an immune compromised in any way, maybe it's not the best idea to travel where Zika virus is or where different viruses are. It's not just look at vaccinations and disease outbreaks outside the U.S., but look what's going on inside the U.S. also. Be sure to check on the outbreaks. Abby, before you go on, did, did you look into Medicare? Because most of us are of that age were on Medicare. How does it work overseas? Um, you, you will probably need to get an, a supplemental policy. Um, and they're, they're fairly reasonable depending on what you're talking about, but you're definitely going to want to, particularly if you may need to be airlifted home. Um, that's where it really gets expensive. Can I make a suggestion? Yes. About that trip insurance, you may want to check your own credit card. Yes, a lot of the credit cards have them. There you go. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, it's, kinda, it's like the sensitivity. It's like your right keypad's left. going. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Okay. All right. Um, maybe for the next presentation we can switch out the computer. Okay. Okay. Um, the CDC is a great, uh, um, a great resource for you, even inside traveling inside the U.S., but particularly traveling outside the U.S. If you're traveling with a chronic illness, you're going to want to... Well, that's the, that's the insurance and the vaccines, but we're going to get to a little bit further. The CDC has recommendations on what you need to do in regards to trip cancellation and insurance, travel health insurance, medical evacuation insurance. That is one that I highly recommend you get. Um, I worked with a patient recently that was in Costa Rica and became very, very ill their insurance didn't cover medical flights home. And we ended up having to find a hardship um, nonprofit to help fly them home. So always be thinking medical evacuation. How are you going to get home? And back to your doctors. The CDC also recommend, uh, has a list of the vaccines, medicines, and advice on their website. You can cross search which vaccines you need. It's a great site. I didn't know this existed. Um, you type in your destination and how your travel and mode of travel, and it will tell you exactly what you need to get in the way of vaccinations. Further, if you're planning on staying for any length of time, there are different vaccinations you may need for a longer period or a longer stay. So it tells you exactly what you need for where you're going. You can also search by country. You type in the country that you're going to and or the name of the disease. If you're worried about um, Chaga virus or Ebola, as an example, you type that in and it'll show you where all of the outbreaks are in the world before you go. Um, there are notices also on the CDC's website that will tell you about the health issues um, for those specific destinations and they will also talk about risks of natural occurrences. So if you're thinking about going to um, Chile, it will say this is the likelihood of earthquakes. This is how many they have. Or this, this season is typhoon season here. This is hurricane season there. 
all things to consider when you're traveling, regardless of whether you have an illness or not. <coughs> medications. When you're traveling, make sure you get a copy of all your prescription medications. Take enough of your medica medical supplies to last through the vacation and then enough to cover any unexpected delays. You don't want to get trapped out of town because of weather or some other circumstance and not have enough medication to cover that. Be the best <coughs> advice that I read online was, if you're planning on being gone seven days, build in another four days of medication. Two days on either side. If you get stuck in a blizzard, if you get la a layover, if something occurs, always have enough medications and keep your prescriptions with you, a copy of the prescriptions. Exactly. And vice versa. You know, I guess you've got to pay attention to that. Well, and the wrong drug into a country. Well, most of the most of the drugs that I have dealt with, um, like IVIG and uh, a lot of the medication, most of the ones that are illegal in other countries have to do with painkillers. Right. Yeah, and uh, you need to check probably with that country's website, and we're coming up to that on what what is available and what the accommodations are. Um, that was another thing that I hadn't really considered when I started researching this topic. Um, if you're going to a country that doesn't speak English, you may want to consider having your orders translated ahead of time um, and doing a summary. Always keep a copy of your contact information and your physician's contact information with you. Uh, you can keep that on the flash drive or you can keep a paper copy. Find out the local physicians. If you're going to be visiting grandkids or visiting someone in another state for five or six weeks, make sure you have a physician lined up in case you need to see. Um, don't, don't be waiting till 11 o'clock at night and going, oh, I don't know who to see in the morning or I'll go to the emergent care. Have an idea uh, of who you're going to see and you can ask your doctor's office for a recommendation. Um, a lot of times they can tell you or they have know someone in the state that you're traveling to. Pack an emergency kit. This is, goes back to the unex, unexpected uh, delays. If you're in a uh, wheelchair or need a mobility device, if you get stuck on an airplane longer than you thought, a lot of airplanes are not necessarily equipped for handicap to be handicapped accessible. Uh, take a bedpan with you or a urinal. Extra wipes and toilet paper. Extra clothing because you might not be able to get to a bathroom in time. And take your extra meds. This was something specific to a wheelchair or a mobility device that I went on and researched with the, uh, the different organizations. And this was one of the number one things they recommended when traveling. And this primarily dealt with people that were paraplegics or quadriplegics. But you always want to have a, a change of clothes and some wipes with you. It, it's not a bad idea. <coughs> this was a surprise to me because when I was in college, I worked with the housing authorities, and I helped set up the ADA accommodations for public housing. The American ADA design requirements for hotels are a little bit different. The one recommendation I make to you if you are in a wheelchair, or depending on what your disability is, if you're planning on traveling, don't just look at the website. If you just look at a website for a hotel, they will say, and I went on a number of them, we are ADA compliant. We have so many ADA rooms. You book the room, and you get there. ADA accommodations break down the number of rooms you have to have per the number of hotel rooms you have, but it doesn't say what those accommodations have to be. You may only have one room that is fully handicap accessible for someone in a wheelchair. You may have some that have the grab bars and assistance devices um, inside the shower but they will not have the insert for raising the toilet up. They will have a lower, a lower seat. 
they only have to have so many rooms for each type of a disability. So before you book a hotel room, call and actually speak to someone at the front desk and say, this is what I need. And you're talking the U.S.? U.S. Well, actually overseas, too. Well, yeah, but uh, ADA really doesn't exist over there. It does and it doesn't. That was something else I found. Uh, it depends on what country you're traveling to. The European Union is, has more regulations in regards to handicap accessibility. Other countries, not necessarily any. Um, that's where it gets a little bit more difficult. And we'll go into a little bit of that in a few minutes. This was the slide that I made up. Accessibility is not standardized in the hotel industry, even inside the US, and can easily be interpreted differently by the employees. That's why you need to call and say, this is the accommodation I need. Rather than look for wheelchair-friendly hotels in the forums or on the websites, call the hotel. That's, that's the best thing you can do. And then there's no guarantee that you're going to have that room yeah. to get there. Nope. Yeah. That, that's, that's the other problem that I was going to mention, is yeah. call the day before and double check. You'll find some chains are better than others. Mm -hmm. you know. This is the other thing. Recru you can request reasonable accommodations. Removing the bed frame or lowering those box springs to a more acceptable height. And this came from a website and a nonprofit that deals with people that are uh, in wheelchairs, usually from accidents. But place the bed frame or risers to provide a guest allow for transfer or hoist to lift them in and out of the bed. Relocate the telephone or equipment to a more accessible position. Remove additional furniture from the room, chairs or tables that may impede access for wheelchairs or scooters or mobility devices. You don't want to be on a walker or scooter and not be able to get around chairs in the hotel room. Um, particularly a lot of times they have those little uh, ottomans. Ask them to remove it. Ask for a mini fridge if they don't have one, if you need it for your medications. They can remove the doors to the bathrooms or interior doors to make accessibility, greater accessibility, and provide extension cords to plug in your um, devices and or your mobility devices. These are things that they said that they're not going, probably not going to help you with. Um, they're not going to provide that hoist. They're not going to provide any of your specialized equipment. And they're not going to adjust the bed if it's, not, if it's like a solid platform bed. If it's not, if they can't just remove the box springs, it's one of those built-in, you know, like boxes that they have in a lot of hotels now. They're not going to, they don't, not going to help you with that, and they're probably not required to. Accommodations outside the U.S. This is where it gets really tricky, depending on where you're planning on going. Primary concern for the dis disabled is try finding a tr hotel that is truly accessible. That goes for inside the U.S. also. Outside the U.S., there's a lot of more difficulties and obstacles to this. If you're planning on traveling overseas, you may want to contact a travel agent and go through an agency that has a niche, like I mentioned earlier, because they will have hotels that they work with specifically. Oh, of course. Be happy to. I'll just stand right here then. How's that? I'll turn my back to you guys for a little bit now. Um, call. If you're going to book the hotel yourself, call ahead of time, talk to someone, and explain your needs. If they don't understand English or they can't assure you, don't book the hotel room. That's, that is the one thing, because you will get there and you may have a flight of stairs to get up that you just can't get up to get to your room. I, I don't make recommendations for travel agencies, um, but you can Google travel agencies that work with disabilities, and okay. there are a number of them. Okay. Now, this is where things get a little bit different, because each mode of transportation has different requirements um, for handicap accessibility. And someone or mentioned earlier they're going on a cruise. 
One thing I hadn't thought of is the cruise ships inside the U.S. are handicap accessible to get on. Your port of calls might not be. And the big thing is they said you could just get stuck on the ship depending on where you're going the whole time you're there because you, you may not be able to get off of it and do anything. Air travel. Air travel is difficult, like we talked about earlier. It's getting more difficult every year, um, particularly with all the different types of tickets, all of the different um, downsizing. So as an example, yesterday, no one actually took my bag to check it. United now, uh, ha in the airport that I was flying from, has a system where when you go check in with the computer, there's, there's no attendant. If you're going to get a, uh, check a bag, you print out your own ticket tag your own bag and carry it up and there's just somebody that weighs it and throws it on the belt. So air travel is getting more difficult and more stressful regardless of whether you have a disability or not. The Air Carrier Access Act of 1986 was designed to prohibit discrimination against people with disabilities for airlines. That doesn't mean it still doesn't exist inside the plane itself. The airports will do everything they can to get you to the gate. They will help you onto the plane, but not many of the planes are designed for people with handicap or accessibility needs. Uh, the law only applies to the following flights. If the flight is departing from the United States, it has to meet the requirements. But if you're flying overseas or on a airline that is not registered in the United States, they do not have to meet any of the requirements. So be sure when you're booking a flight what airline you're booking on. The flight arriving to any US airport, regardless of carrier, has to have the accommodations. But again, that is for a flight leaving the US or coming to the US. If you go to Ireland, for an example, and you're flying from Ireland to France, the airline may not have any accommodations for you. So you want to look at the airline and speak with the airline that you're going to fly with. Book your flight well in advance. Call the airline directly to make sure that they can meet your needs. Document the day and time and the person you spoke with. How many times have we had fights with the airline? You need to know who said that they could accommodate you, when you spoke to them, and what they said the accommodation would be. Request your seat as soon as possible. Um, you're probably going to want one of the front seats, so you have uh, room for your uh, mobility device. Be they can take some of these seats out and the armrests out. Arrange your ground transportation ahead of time. So if you know your flight's leaving at 7 a.m. and you're flying out of a major airport, call ahead of time and make sure that you have someone to help you to get to the gate well ahead of time. I'm, I'm not sure I follow what you said. About, I've never heard of an airline taking seats out for mobility device, it, nor have I ever seen a They, it depends on the airline. There are airlines that uh, will have a place for just a wheelchair, like the movie theaters. They've been building them. That was one of the things that I read. Have you seen the uh, when you go to a movie theater, there's just the seats now for wheelchairs? Oh, yeah. They, theoretically, I've never seen it either. Theoretically, they can, but I have never seen it. The airlines would have to actually give up the seat to do that? They'd give up the seat that you're in. Um, arrive at the airport early. Because even if you've arranged transportation to your gate, if you need help, that doesn't mean it's going to be there. So leave yourself an extra hour. If it says arrive two hours early, arrive three hours early. You don't want to miss your flight because they didn't, they didn't get you to your gate. If you need assistance, you can request that an unticketed passenger Say, for instance, if you have a, uh, an adult child, they can come with you all the way to the gate. 
go through security, help you carry your stuff, help you get on the plane. You have to request that in advance. You can go into the airline check-in desk to receive a pass. Um, I've done this when I've uh, taken my, I have children and they've flown on their own. You call the airline ahead of time, say that I'm going to be taking, walking my child to the gate, and you get a pass. If you have special dietary requirements and you're going to be on a long flight, you can request special diet, diet for the flight. Never ever book a flight that you do not have time or you're rushed to get from one gate to the other. That make sure that you have at least 90 minutes between flights. Always count on your flight coming in being late. Always count on the fact that you're going to need extra time to get to that gate. So if you book your flight with only a half an hour to get between gates, you may not make it, particularly if your flight's late. I mean, it's kind of good advice for anybody, but particularly if you have need accommodations. This one, again, like we said, I have never really seen an airplane bathroom that was a... I, I, I read that and I'm like... And that kind of goes back to the stuff that you need to pack if you're actually fully in a wheelchair. Um, a person with normal mobility has a heck of a time in, a uh, in an airline. I, 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 I was talking to one of my friends who's an attorney ahead of time and she specializes in ADA and she just laughed. She's like, I, can, I can't even turn around in those. <laughs> I know. Um, plan for delays. Again, make sure if you need medication during the day that you haven't put it in your suitcase. Make sure you have it on your person. Um, you can check all of your medications through security and medical devices. Don't pack your medications in your suitcase. Particularly if they lose your suitcase, you're in trouble. Ask for assistance. A lot of times people don't want to be a bother or they, they're embarrassed. If you need help while you're at the airport, ask for assistance from the airline. They will help you get on the, airline, uh, the airplane. They will help you get off the airplane. They will get you from one gate to the other. Ask for assistance. <clears throat> this is where we get to European travel, particularly on planes. Um, I think you brought up that there are no laws really for travel outside the US. There are some. They're definitely not as extensive. The European Union has outlined the rights of individuals flying with disabilities, very similar to what the US has done. Um, but it depends on what's, what country they're departing from and what country they're flying to. So this is, again, where you either need to call ahead of time or you need to go through a travel agency that specializes. Those are some of the uh, airlines that do offer accommodations. TSA, which we already touched on, allows you to take your medications through the checkpoints once they've been screened. Be sure to keep your medications in their original containers. Um, a lot of times people think, oh, well, I know exactly how many I need of this, and I know exactly how many I need of that, and they'll put, try and put them all in the same bottle. TSA will not allow that through. You have to have all the pills in their correct bottle. So if they do open up your medication or on screening, if they see two or three different sizes or shapes in a bottle, they will not allow it through. So keep your medications in the original containers. It does not hurt to have a letter with you that you, what you need is medically necessary. You can get that from your doctor ahead of time. What to have on your carry-on. Make sure your medications and your supplies come with you on the airplane. Don't check them. If you are in a wheelchair and cannot use the bathroom in a flight, be sure you have a bedpan or a urinal. Um, that was something that I had never thought about um, and I've done a lot of work, like I said, with taking medications on flights and arranging people to have their treatments overseas. I'd never thought about the disability issue and what you need, what the additional steps would be. And then I spoke with a person from the nonprofit, and they said, 
make sure that you always are set up to where you don't don't have a problem. Train travel. Check the website of the system you're looking at. If you are inside of a city and are looking at taking a metro or a metro link, um, check their website. They should have accommodations for you. And then call and confirm accessibility. Um, if you are looking at traveling by train, like an Amtrak, the tr and outside the US, train networks across the world, including Amtrak, have devices that allow you to bridge the gap between the platform and the train. You call ahead of time and or ask, check in early, and they will place the ramp for you. They're called bridge plates, and that allows you access onto the train. If you need assistance inside the US on an Amtrak, when you call to book your ticket, be sure to tell them that you need assistance. You will also receive a discount if you do have a mobility device. International travel and travel, uh, and travel outside the United States, there is no single rail operator like there is Amtrak inside the US. Um, it can make dig very difficult to figure out what trains you can take. It's something that you will need to not only check on that country's website for that train system, but you'll also need to call and confirm that they do have accessible, accessible trains. They may have the bridge to get you onto the train, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily going to have a spot for your wheelchair when you're on the train. Purchase tickets in person so you can speak with an operator. If this is particularly important if you're in another country and you're planning on doing Eurorail or something along those lines, make sure you speak to someone in person, explain what your, the disability is for you or your partner. They should be able to help you with a request on the assistance for the wheelchair. And many rail systems, not just Amtrak, offer discounts. Book your ticket more than 24 hours in advance. Um, don't go to the window that morning and say, I need a handicapped accessible train ticket. There, one, you have to probably reserve that seat ahead of time because there's only going to be limited number of spaces. Arrive early. Ask for assistance. You're not going to be able to get on the train without that bridging plate. You can on the Metrolinx. It's a flat platform from one surface to the other. Trains, though, typically you have to step up into. Look for a seat next to a charging station. Um, if you have a motorized scooter or wheelchair and you're on the train for a couple of hours or days, if you're taking a long trip, you're going to need to travel or to charge your wheelchair. Cruise travel. Before booking a cruise, ensure your ship can meet your needs since not all cruise ships are handicapped accessible. Ships have different requirements and a lot of them are not registered inside the United States. They have ports of call in the United States, but their version of handicapped accessible may not meet your needs. So be sure to check with the cruise line. Again, talk to someone in person. Websites are not going to go over the details that you're, or your specific needs. The website may say handicapped accessible. That doesn't necessarily mean it's wheelchair accessible. But they there are a number that are, but particularly if you're looking at cruising if you're overseas. And I have done that as well, and they are. They are accessible? Mm -hmm. They have the uh, special needs department that yep. they but, but call ahead of time and make sure that you, you ask for their, your accommodations when you book. And you can do it when you book. I always ask for handicapped women, and I always get called back from the special needs department. That's exactly what my needs are. You know, I get elevated toilet seats. I get a cabin that does not have any step up to the bathroom. 
Um, I even had to put extra mattress on my bed because it was sometimes that I lowered to get those hard for us. I was going to say that was one of the things is to raise or lower the mattresses. Yeah. But ag again, they're only required to have so many rooms like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so you have to book early. You have to tell them what your specific needs are. Um, successful tip, tips for a successful cruise. Look for port of calls. Um, if you're looking at disembarking the ship, make sure that where you are going has places that you can actually go and see stuff. Um, or that the city that you're in has accessibility. It, it, it's a little bit difficult if you get off the cruise and there's nothing for you to do. And then you just have to get back onto the cruise ship. That, that's one of the things that I was going to say that's one of the things that's coming up is if you have to take a shuttle to shore, you're not going ashore. That, that's if you're in a wheelchair. If you're, I mean, if you're in a walker, maybe. Um, if you're on a scooter, probably not and because they're not going to take your scooter in the shuttle. Know your equipment. Do not leave your equipment unattended. Um, theft is a big problem uh, anywhere, but you don't want to leave your scooter if you're in a restaurant unattended at the front of the building. Make sure that you have an eye, eye sight or line of sight to it. Charge your equipment nightly. It was an absolutely hysterical video on Watch Your Speed. It was, a, <laughs> it was like an 80-year-old woman tearing down the hallway and a cruise ship just knocking people out of her way on her scooter. It was, my mother used to do that, so I thought it was really funny. <laughs> Ask for assistance while you're on the ship. Um, the other thing is watch corners. When you're in a scooter, particularly on a ship, if the ship is swaying a little bit and you take a corner too fast, you have to make sure you don't tip. Um, keep the help number if, for the, um, the ship um, readily accessible. You can call and someone will come and help you at any time, 24 hours a day in your stateroom. Consult with a travel agent who specializes in booking cruises. They can help you um, meet your needs. Automobile travel. Map out a route of travel ahead of time. If you're planning on going across the country, know where you're going, know where you're stopping every evening. Make sure your friends or family know where you're supposed to be from one point to the other. I'm driving from Omaha to Chicago. I'll be in Chicago this night, then I'm going to be in this city. Book your hotel room ahead of time. Service your car before you leave. If you haven't had your tires checked, your brakes checked, and your oil changed in a while, if you're planning on traveling cross country, go in and have a check all the way bumper to bumper. Make sure your mobility equipment is in good order, working order and bring a travel size repair kit containing all of the necessary tools and mater materials including a pneumatic tire replacement. The travel industry as I mentioned at the beginning is recognizing the fact that with ADA accommodations people with disabilities are traveling more and they have responded by in creating niche markets inside the tourism industry with travel specialists. All right, we're running a little bit behind because of the uh, issues with the PowerPoint, but does anyone have any questions? Not a question, but in Florida, um, if you have a vehicle that has a specific um, attachment to the rear of it showing that it is a wheelchair van, Mm -hmm. My understanding is that airports will not charge you to park while you are traveling. I so wouldn't know about that it one. Doesn't, you know, it doesn't do any good to have just a handicap tag, but if you've got a wheelchair transporter on the back of your van. So that's, that's apparently the law in Florida. It's worth checking wherever you're going elsewhere considering how much airports charge to park. Oh, that, that is a lot. <laughs> The tip that's worked really well for us uh, on any of your smartphones, whether it be an Apple or an Android based phone, you can get Google Translate. It's an offline translate service, so you can be able to, you don't have to be able to connect to the local wireless connection or a Wi Fi connection, you can work without that. And you can put in your language and you can translate to any other language. You do need to 
download that ahead of time. I, I was going to say, I have Google Translate. Sometimes it translates things a little funky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Better, yeah, I was going to say, uh, yeah. Be, be, yeah. for your basic yeah. needs, yes. Don't try and don't try, try and communicate a complicated thought with Google Translate. <laughs> we had an issue where we were trying to board a plane, and they came out, and I said, no, I need a ramp. Like, I can't do stairs. I need a mm -hmm. ramp. And before we, we thought about using that, they were going to grow up there and try to pull me up physically, oh. pull me up in a chair. I'm like, no. That's where are we traveling? Uh, this was from the DR to yeah, I was going to say that's why if you can check ahead of time what the accommodations are and make sure they understand your specific needs because, yeah, I, w I wouldn't want to be picked up like that either. And you're, you're I don't mean, no, no, you're I'm a big guy. <laughs> yeah, just to comment a little bit on Amtrak. You mentioned Amtrak. Uh, the, the sleeping rooms on, on Amtrak are pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, Two different kinds of equipment. One used more in the West, one more in the East. But they, my wife and I have used, and my wife has used the one with the wheelchair, have used those and, and been pretty sa pretty satisfied. Now she for for that trip she used a manual chair and there was plenty of room um, in, in the what they call the superliner um, accessible room. Whether you, whether it would hold a, a large scooter. They say you can take a power chair on board. If it were a large power chair, I think the room might be a little tight, but you can still move around. But what, what, what I was going to, and, and, and both rooms, both different types of rooms, have toilets in the room. One has, they, the one they use in the East has a shower as well. The Western double level cars, the shower's down the hall. But it actually is pretty accessible. I, mean, it, I was going to say, I've, I've been in the handicapped accessible little room, bathrooms, you know, and they're pretty there's good. There's a dressing room, the shower has a seat. Um, uh, but uh, if, if you're looking for a sleeping room, you talk about booking ahead. Yeah, you better book ahead. Months way and months ahead. ahead. That's, I was because just going to bring that point most up. Most trains only have, there's one per car, mm -hmm. and a lot of trains only have, only have two. two sleepers, sometimes three. Uh, so there, but and as far as discounts go, the discount is actually quite amazing. My uh, my wife and I, it was it was no more expensive for the two of us to travel with a sleeping accommodation, uh, a, a accessible sleeping accommodation, than it would have been for me to travel by myself. I was going to say that it, it, the discounts. Yeah, I was surprised. Book, you can book online. You can easily book accessible and just click, you know, person with disability and companion with disability, and then it asks you what kind of disability. And if it meets the requirements, it takes you right to, if, the, if there's a room available. If I was going to say, anyway. I was going to say, as part of this, I researched and I went in to Amtrak to see that website that you're talking about. And I ended up going six months out to yeah. find a handicap accessible room. So if you're looking at any distance travel on Amtrak, you need to be looking months in advance to book that room. Uh, yeah, at least months. Um, it, it's, that is not something like you can go in and book it that day or the day before. Um, you need to book it, yeah, you need to book it way in advance. Um, and, and they don't sell those rooms to non-disabled people no. until two weeks before that's, that, that, that's on the website. But two weeks before, then they will from what I can tell, it's booked. They don't ever sell it to someone that isn't disabled because they're, they're book solid. Do airlines have any way to accommodate a scooter or a power chair? This, they, they are, scooters and power chairs are usually, like the other gentleman said, put below. And then they, they have people help you onto the airplane. If you were in a power chair, you could get that to your destination if you had a wheelchair to get you onto the plane? They, they, I believe they allow you to check your yeah. scooter. That, that would be, that, at least that's what I read. But you would have to check with the individual airline on that. Okay. And that's why the, the amazing thing I found is there's no real standardization. I called two of the different airlines and said, what do you do with this? And I looked at the, what the federal regulations were, and it's pretty open-ended. It says they have to accommodate 
but what accommodate means is really loosely defined. So that's why all the websites that I looked at and the people that I spoke to said, call, talk to someone at the airline, make sure you know who you're talking to, and have everything set up ahead of time. I think the practical matter is flying when you're in a wheelchair or handicap, and this is a very short distance, uh, is, is an impossibility. Okay. There's, there's no way you can get a handicapped person into a, a toilet yep. on a flat. Um, so, you know, saying you, can, you should uh, not be um, hindered by a disability or you should expand your horizons is, is kind of impractical. Um, and even in the Wall Street Journal just this past week, Airlines are now making the bathrooms even smaller. I read that. I was going to say the, the one gentleman I spoke to from the Handicap Accessible um, website, I called and spoke. He was one of the founders of the nonprofit. He's an attorney that is not quite a quadriplegic. And he said, and he flies all over the country. He flies with a catheter because that is his only option. He flies literally every week, and he said that he flies basically with an adult that pens and a catheter, because that is the only way that he can get from point A to point B if it's more than an hour or so on a flight. So that pretty much rules how the flies. If, you, if you're doing the shorter flights or if you are not fully in a wheelchair, um, it is... Like I said, the topic was have wheelchair will travel, but it's broader. It also covers people that are in scooters or on walkers. But when, when you are fully in a wheelchair, flying becomes much more difficult. You don't have to be fully in a wheelchair. My, my, my wife is not fully in a wheelchair. But, but when we get to the bathroom, I have to be there. To, and there's no way to get her in and out. To lower her, so. um, I just wanted to say that I, I do have a travel scooter. So I still have mobility, but like when I buy tickets for a concert and things like that, um, you know, it, you, they also like they ran out of uh, wheelchair. Oh, seats. seats. You can also maybe call and ask for easy access, which means you'll be in the first row and maybe just take one step down. So when I go to my football games, I ask for easy access. And, and that at least is better than either going up or down eight or, ten or 15 rows. They'll just have you just go down one. So because a lot of times the handicap seating is taken. Well, and that's, that's the one thing that everyone that I spoke with and all the research said is if you are <coughs> handicapped, you need to pre-plan and, and make sure what the accommodations the facility offers are and make sure that you have your spot reserved because there's so many people vying for very few seats or areas of accommodation. Oh, I have one more. I just wanted to recommend uh, train travel in Europe. If you're uh, going to Europe, it's fabulous. You can go from London to Paris to Brussels to Amsterdam. First class for handicapped Yep, that's what it Your said. Is first class, half price. And I was going to say, and Europe and actually offers a bigger discount than the U.S. on don't train have travel. To go to the friggin' airport. <laughs> it's just getting there. You can cruise to Europe. <laughs> Down, London to Amsterdam, seven hours, first class. So how did you did and how did you fl did you fly? Yeah. Did you have any trouble with the flying? We just fly Air Canada. Air Canada. Any other questions? I believe you have to have a mobility, need a mobility device. Could you repeat that question? Um, how, what is the level of your disability? Do you need to be able to receive the discount? I believe you need to have a mobility device and or um, have a letter from a physician saying that you need to have the grab bars and the raised. 
but that, the discount does include, um, in Europe, does include your companion also, and in the United States, I believe it's just for the one ticket and not the other. Mm -hmm. And we do have a doctor statement that the airline seems to have changed what they want a required update or something before you can now go and fly. Well, un unfortunately, there have been some recent cases that have brought companion animals to attention. Um, I think everybody saw the woman that wanted to fly with the peacock. So... And there's been a lot of cases, yeah, exactly. There have been a lot of cases of people saying that an animal is a companion animal when they're really not. Um, I live in Los Angeles now, and everywhere you go, including the grocery store, there are dogs everywhere. I mean, they're, they're in the shopping carts, they're in the shopping malls, they're in restaurants, not, and all they have to do is say, it's my companion animal, and they go everywhere. Um, I don't see that anybody's going to be cracking down that on that in Los Angeles anytime soon. Me too, though. It, it's, getting a, it's getting a little ridiculous. And I, I, love do, I love dogs, but, you know, I, I was in the grocery store the other day, and there was, like, four different dogs wandering up and down the aisles, and I'm like, really? Yeah. <laughs> but that is part of the reason the airline, uh, there was a big newspaper article that I believe it was in, I think it was in the New York Times, talking about the fact that the airlines are going to be cracking down on what's considered a companion animal. If you want to bring your pot-bellied pig on the plane, probably not. The reason for that is because you can get online and get all this certification, and the dog really, or whatever you've got, really is it a company, an open dog, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Anybody can get online and get that, and I think that's what happened. Yep. You know, we have too much of this scam going on, and the people that really need it are the ones that are fighting to get it, and the other ones... And, but that, that, that was one thing that came up, and I assumed when I saw the dog come in that we were going to get an, uh, a question on companion animals. And that, that, is, that is the big stickler right now is the fact that the system is being abused so badly that, that they're cracking down. I'm going to leave cards up here. Um, again, I am the patient advocate for IG Living Magazine. If anybody wants to receive a copy of the magazine, it is free of charge to all patients and their families. Um, all you need to do is email me and I'll make sure you start getting copies of the magazine. Or you can down, go online and download it. Yeah, we're, we went paperless, but we also do provide a hard copy. Did you want one? Cytosis Association Helping patients become peers Now for the past 25 years So if you have been diagnosed Here's an organization to unite us 8,000 members they can boast For that real strange word that no one's heard It's myositis an annual patient conference which is just second to none where you'll learn a lot and network and you'll also have some fun and their website is updated with a lot of current news with lots of info and resources and much more that you can use like info tma compiles and like list of clinical trials and lists of research too you can review because it's all there for you so hooray Myositis Association Helping patients become peers Now for the past 25 years So if you have been diagnosed Here's an organization to unite us A quarter century they can boast They've been the group that's got the scoop on myositis